Hi and welcome to this lesson on the Elise Duet Concertina by Concertina Connection. And as always, I want to say a big thank you to my good friend Bill in the United States, who is the sponsor of this and all my Elise videos. Thank you very much, Bill. Really hope you're getting something from these videos. Today, I'm not going to teach you a new tune, but I'm going to show you how to understand the layout of this remarkable instrument. And it's a really clever layout, as you will see. I've got lots of charts to show you today. And this first one, we've got all the notes available on the Elise. First of all, on the left side of the instrument, and I've put the name and my code under each note. So you've got C, D, E, F, F sharp, G, A, B flat, B, C, C sharp, and then it changes to treble clef, D, E, F, F sharp, G. And what I've done here, I put change row F, change row B. Change row F means you've got to change row and go forward to get the next note. If you're on this note of E here on the first row, which to go to F, you've got to go forward to get the note F, then come back, change row B to get the F sharp. You see, so this chart shows you the names of the notes and it shows you the position on the concertina. R1, B1, row 1, B1, row 1, B2, that sort of thing. And it's all the notes in ascending order, so as the notes go up. As I said in a previous video, the order of the notes is interrupted by the fact that you have to keep going backwards and forwards between the rows. So this chart shows you where you need to change, either going forward or backwards. Now, notice down here, when I get to the note C sharp, I've changed the clef to treble clef, and I said this before, otherwise all these notes would be up here really high, some of them on quite hard to follow ledger lines. So this isn't a hard and fast rule where I've made this split. Some people split before the C, it depends on the tune you're playing. So anyway, these last one, two, three, four, five, six notes I've put on the treble clef. This is the highest note on the left-hand side, and it's the A, row four, button three. So these are all the notes on the left-hand side, going from this C here to this A here. Here's the same thing for the right hand. Exactly the same notes, but an octave higher, of course. Everything is on the treble clef, and you've got this change row four, change row back. So I'll just show you this in this camera. So let's start with C, row one, B one. D, row one, B two. Next door neighbor. E, row 1, B, 3. Then to go to the F, we've got to change row and go forward to here. F is row 2, button 1. And then to go to the next note that's higher than that, we have to come back to row 1, and it's row 1, button 4, which is the F sharp, so just above the F, you see. Then we have to come forward again, change row for the note G, row 2, B, 2. Row 2, B, 3 is the A. And then we have to change row again and come forward and up to row 3, B1 for the B flat. In case you don't know, B flat and A sharp are the same thing, but we tend to call it B flat, okay? So we've played our B flat, but now it says change row B. Got to come back to row 2, button 4 to get the B. Here that's higher than the B flat. Then we've got to change row again to come to row 3, button 2 for the C. And then we change row again come back to row two, button five for the C sharp. It's a bit of a rigmarole, isn't it? This changing backwards and forwards. Then we change row yet again. We come to row three, button three for the D. So those few notes there from the A on the previous stave, you've got A, B flat, B, C, C sharp, D. So we get all of that from changing from row two to three and backwards and forwards. Okay, so we've reached D, row three, button three, then we keep going down that row. E is row three, button four. And then we change row again. Row four, button one gives us the F. Come back to row three, button five for the F sharp. We come back to row four, button two for the G. And a little bit lower down here, we finish on row four, button three, highest note, which is the note A on that ledger line there. So to move up and up and up and up, you do so much changing row, don't you? There are how many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 changes of row. So let's just play that ascending group of notes. This is all the notes on the right hand side in ascending order with all the changing of rows. So we've got C, D, E, F, F sharp, G, A, B flat, 
B, C, C sharp, D, E, F, F sharp, G, A. And obviously it's exactly the same thing on the left hand side. That seems really weird, doesn't it? But it will make sense when you understand the isomorphic nature of this keyboard. And that sounds really complicated, but I'll demystify that for you in a short while. Let's move to our next chart now. This is the actual order of notes row by row. Here it is on the left hand. So you've got C, D, E and F sharp on row one. F, G, A, B and C sharp on row two. B flat C, D, E and F sharp on row three. And F, G and A on row four. Notice that split there where we changed the treble clef. We've got the same thing on the right hand side. I'll just show you the right hand side. So on row one, we've got C, D, E, F sharp. On row two, we've got F, G, A, B and C sharp, five notes. On row three, the five notes are B flat, C, D, E and F sharp. And on row four, we've got F, G and A. So what happens here is that the notes are climbing up by a whole tone each time we move down one button on the same row. So two semitones. So let's go back to row one. So from C to D is a tone. D to E is a tone. E to F sharp is a tone. So that's what we call a whole tone scale. It's the first four notes of a whole tone scale, starting with a C. And then when we go to row two, we reset, starting with F. So F to G is a tone. G to A is a tone. A to B is a tone. And B to C sharp is a tone. So a tone is two semitones. A semitone is the shortest distance between two notes, and a tone is the next shortest. So F to G to A to B to C sharp whole tones, two semitones. In row three, we reset with B flat, go up in tones, B flat, C, D, E, and F sharp. And then on row four, we reset with the F, and we go F, G, A. So in each row, all of the notes are one tone, a whole tone, or two semitones apart. So here's row one. Here's row two, F, G, A, B, C sharp. Here is row three, B flat, C, D, E, F sharp. And row four, F, G, A. So it does start to make a little bit of sense. It's not kind of a haphazard arrangement of notes. There is sense to it, but it will make even more sense a bit later on in this video, so please stick with it. Let's go to our next chart. Now this chart says the complete chromatic range of notes from the C below middle C to the A an octave above the C above middle C. Right, have a look at this keyboard here. What I've got on this keyboard are all the notes from C up to this A here. And I put a piece of paper across it. So all of this up to that piece of paper, that is the entire range of the Elise Duet Concertina. We don't get all of these notes. Some of these black notes are missing. So between this C note here and this A note here, we've got the entire range of notes that we find on the Elise Concertina. Now we're missing a few of these black notes. So we haven't got all of these 34 notes. If an instrument is said to be fully chromatic, you're provided with every single note within the range of the instrument. To understand this better, Imagine you are sitting at a piano keyboard, something like this here, see? And you played every note from left to right, including all the black notes, from the C below middle C, which is generally called C3, up to and including the A, which is above the C, which is an octave above middle C, which is called A5. So if I play all these notes, I don't know if you can see this, but every single note left to right,
that's what we call playing chromatically every single note from left to right that we come to. Okay, so if the Elise provided all these notes, we would have a total of 34 notes, uh, but it doesn't. There are a few missing. So taking into consideration the lowest note of the instrument, which is the C below middle C, okay, which is called C3. Little word of warning there, some people call middle C, C3, most people call it C4. I call it C4, so this one, which is an octave below, I call C3. So taking into consideration the lowest note of the instrument, okay, which is the C below middle C on the left hand side, row one, B1, row one, button one, and the highest note, which is the A above the C, which is an octave above middle C, this one here, which is row four, button three, called A5, this note. Let's see on our chart how many of those notes are provided and how many are missing. Right, so look at the chart and you can see the notes starting on the left hand, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and every note that is missing I've written no underneath. So we've got C, but we haven't got C sharp. We've got D, we haven't got D sharp. So C sharp is one semitone higher than C. D sharp is one semitone higher than D. So yes to C, no C sharp. Yes to D, no D sharp. We've got E, we've got F, we've got F sharp, we've got G. Let's go to our next stage. All those yeses mean that we've got that note on our instrument. We haven't got the G sharp that's just above the G. We've got the A, we've got the B flat, we've got the B, now it says B nat, that is B natural, B if you like. I've had to call it B natural because I've had to flatten the B before it, see? Okay, so this thing that looks a bit like a small letter B is a flat sign, so that's flatten the B. Because I've had to obey the rules in music, I've had to naturalise this B, otherwise it would automatically be B flat. So this is B nat, B natural, or just B if you like. So we've got that note, which is here, okay? We've got the C, we've got the C sharp. Now we're gonna to go to the treble clef. We've got the D, we haven't got the D sharp, okay? We've got the E, we've got the F, we've got the F sharp, we've got the G, we haven't got the G sharp, and we do have the A. So you can see, notes from this point overlap with the right hand's possible range. So from the C onwards, okay, which is middle C, we've got those notes on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Incidentally, this C sharp is special, okay, because it exists on the left hand side here, okay, which is uh, row two, button five, but on the right hand side, We've got the C, middle C, but we haven't got that C sharp. So there's a few missing. How many missing? Let's count the nose up. One, two, three, four, five nose. Five notes that are missing on that left hand side. In this chart here, on the left hand side, there are three exclusive notes missing. The C sharp three, just above the C. Okay, the next D sharp, which is D sharp three, and the next G sharp up from there, which is G sharp three. And then we get to the overlap. In other words, the notes we find on both sides of the instrument. And within these, we don't have the first D sharp up from middle C and the G sharp above that. So we're missing this C sharp, this D sharp. We are also missing this G sharp. Okay, so those three are exclusive to the left hand side. We're also missing this D sharp and this G sharp. Okay, so a few missing. So it's not completely chromatic is what I'm trying to say. Let's look at the chart on the next page, page six, and it's the same thing for the right hand. Now on the right hand, there are the same two sharps missing as we're missing on the left hand. The first D sharp which is D sharp four, up from middle C, and the G sharp up from that. Here's our middle C, okay? So we haven't got that C sharp, but we have got that C sharp in the left hand, okay? And we haven't got this D sharp, we haven't got this G sharp, okay? We haven't got this D sharp, and we haven't got this G sharp. 
So on the right hand side there are the same two shops missing as we're missing on the left hand side. The first D sharp up from middle C and the G sharp above that. In addition we also don't have the C sharp 4 just above middle C which we do have on the left hand side. The D sharp 5 above the C which is an octave above middle C and the G sharp 5 above that. So try to pray see this a bit for you. To summarise, taking both hands into account, including the overlap of notes that exist on both sides of the instrument, out of a possible 34 notes, all of these notes, all the whites and the blacks here, we've only got 27. So there are seven missing. We are missing C sharp three, D sharp three, G sharp three, then we're missing D sharp four, G sharp four, D sharp five, and G sharp five. All of those black notes are missing. So we have seven notes missing over the entire range of the instrument. So this chart on page seven shows all 34 possible notes chromatically ascending from C3 to A5. And you can see where we have the note and where we don't have the note. Yes to C, no to C sharp, yes to D, no to D sharp. And it shows you what side of the instrument you find the note. Um, in some cases you can find the note on both sides of the instrument like this C and this D here. This C sharp is this special one which is not available on the right hand but is available on the left hand all the way up to this note of A which is row 4, button 3, right hand side. So what's the takeaway from this? Well on the Elise there are no D sharp notes so therefore no E flat notes it's the same thing there are no G sharp notes and therefore no A flat notes because they're the same thing which means you can't play in all keys but you can certainly play in all the kind of folky keys that you probably need to play the stuff you want to do unless you're seriously into classical music now concertina connection do an instrument called the troubadour which is a much higher quality instrument and it's got a couple of extra notes. It's got a G sharp four and a D sharp five and it also has a G sharp five on the right hand side. So those extra sharps are going to mean that the instrument is completely chromatic. There is at least one example of all 12 notes. The trade-off is there's no air button separate like it is on the Elise. What happens there on the left hand side you lose this note of A it becomes an air button on the troubadour but you've got to think about the price at the moment uh, the Elise is about £475 in the UK and the troubadour is about £1800 so you're paying an awful lot of money uh, for a few extra buttons but it's not just that of course it's the quality of the instrument it's going to be much easier to play than the Elise it won't feel quite so stiff it's smaller and it's lighter Everything comes at a price, as you know, so you've got to factor that in and decide whether it's worth making that jump from the Elise to the Troubadour. Right, so look at this. This looks a complete mess, doesn't it? But it will make sense in a moment. We have a chart of all the notes. This is the either side, right hand or left hand. We'll call it right hand for the moment. So this is row one, C, D, E, F sharp. These notes here. This is row two. F, G, A, B and C sharp, okay? And then this is the next row, row three, B flat, C, D, E, F sharp, okay? And this is the row furthest away from you, the player, which is F, G and A on row four. Notice how these buttons are staggered, the way I've drawn them, that's how they are in real life. You can see that the F is higher up than the C and the B flat is higher up than the F, you see? So it's kind of a staggered thing. All right, so that's all the notes. Now, the second part of the chart is showing the same thing, but it's showing all the major second intervals. Now, what is a major second? Well, let's talk about a minor second, first of all. The shortest distance from one note to the next is called a minor second. So if I play F and I play F sharp, that's called a minor second one note slightly above the other. Now if I play those two notes together it sounds really horrible so we tend to avoid that. There are a few minor second intervals on this instrument. For instance that one I showed you there, F to F sharp.
those notes are a semitone apart, commonly known as a minor second. All right. Now let's look at major seconds. Major seconds are one tone apart. And the amazing thing about this uh, keyboard, the way it's set out, is that if we just go down the rows, as I've already told you, as you move to the next button down, you're going up by a whole tone, commonly known as a major second. So every time you move from one button down to the next one, on any row, that is an interval of a major second. So if you look at the diagram, there you can see the arrows going along from C to D is a major second. From D to E is a major second. E to F sharp is a major second. So it's all about this keyboard being isomorphic. What does that mean? It means that the intervals or gaps between the notes have the same shape across the entire layout of buttons. It's actually amazingly clever and very useful, especially when it comes to forming chords, which we will be doing in a later lesson. What are intervals? Intervals are gaps in pitch between two notes. Like I said, that that horrible noise there, that's an interval of a minor second. From C to D, that's a major second. Still sounds a bit car horn like. You don't tend to play minor seconds or major seconds together because they don't sound very good. Some of these shapes that I put on this chart are so stretched out that the sheer shortage of buttons will constrict the amount of available intervals, especially where the major sevenths are concerned and I'll deal with those in a little while. I'm using the right side of the instrument but it's exactly the same on the left. So every time I say upwards, if you're looking at your left hand side of your instrument, you need to hear me say downwards, okay, because it's different direction. That's an interesting point actually because the Troubadour concertina I was talking about has two available layouts which I didn't know until yesterday. It's got one the same as this on the Elise where we have the C there on the right hand side and the C there on the left hand side but there's another way round where it's identical on both sides so the direction is the same. I'm not sure how I get on with that but if I ever do go up to a troubadour, I think I'll have it the same as this, the, the bi-directional uh, keyboard, as they call it. So the major second interval, up to semitones or one tone, can be found along the rows of the instrument. Simply move downwards from one button to the next. All those intervals are a major second. So C to D, D to E, that's that whole tone scale I was talking about. Obviously it resets on every row. It doesn't continue from one row to the next. So each row resets with the button at the start of that row. Right, next one we're going to deal with is the minor third. Minor third interval. This is one tone and one semitone. And this is really easy. It can be found by going upwards diagonally to the next row and then along two buttons. So if I play this note here, we know it's D, it's button two, row one. So if I come forward to row two and up one button, that note is F. So if I play D and F together, that is called a minor third. That's a tone and a semitone. So every time you make that shape, look, all of these are minor thirds. Okay? So D to F is a minor third. E to G is a minor third. You see? F sharp to A is a minor third. G to B flat is a minor third. See, so it's go to the next row, come up one, and that's the note that is a minor third above that note. And it's the same right across the keyboard, you see? So that's what makes it isomorphic. This interval is very important when forming minor chords. Okay? In Drunken Sailor, we did a chord of D minor. All right, we did it on the other side of the instrument. We had D, and we had F, and we had A as well. See, that chord there was that minor third there, and we just added the A, which is the fifth. Okay, so that's a minor third. The major third interval, which is up two tones, so it's going slightly further along than the minor third, can be found by going downwards along the row, just like the major second, okay, but missing one button out. So if I play this button, and then I miss this one out, I play this button, those two notes there, just using those fingers to show you. That's a major third, C to E. Okay, or D to F sharp. See, play one, miss one, play one. 
or we've got F here, miss out G, play A, F and A, see? That's a major third. G to B is a major third. Okay, we've got A to C sharp is a major third. B flat to D is a major third. So play one, miss one, play one. That's a major third. And obviously that's a very important interval when forming major chords. I'm not dealing with chords per se in this uh, video, but I will be in a future one. But this is going to give you a good starting point for that. So obviously you need at least three buttons to do this. So if you start here, obviously you haven't got a button that you can form the major third with. So you need three in a row at least. Although this is, I suppose, a bit boring in some ways, I find it very interesting. And from the point of view of learning this instrument, you want to know your way around the keyboard. And this is a great way uh, to do just that. Fourth intervals can be found by going upwards diagonally in a straight line from one row to another. Now, you remember our minor third, we went up and then along. Well, this one is just up. So if I go from this note to this note, which is in this case a D to a G, that is a fourth, sometimes called a perfect fourth. So if I come from C to F, that is a fourth. Okay, from E to A is a fourth. So F sharp to B, that's a fourth. So wherever you make that shape, just go along the diagonal, wherever you can do that, all those intervals are a fourth commonly known as a perfect fourth. And that's a very important interval when forming sus4 chords. Now you may not have heard that before, but it's a chord we use a lot, in certainly in pop music. So fourths, perfect fourths. So we have fifths as well. We did a fifth in a previous song, I think. And these can be found by going downwards diagonally in a straight line. So we came upwards diagonally for the fourth. So if we go downwards diagonally, that's a fifth. So if I go from uh, row one, button one, which is C, to row two, button two, which is G, that interval, C to G, is a fifth. Same here. This is a D, this is an A, D to A is a fifth. This is an E, that's a B, E to B is a fifth. Wherever you make this downwards diagonal, okay, they're all fifths. So this note is B flat, Okay, this note is F, B flat to F is a fifth, perfect fifth it's called sometimes. So exactly the same as the fourth interval but going the other way. So C to G is a fifth, okay, this one here, D to A is a fifth. They're a bit like trumpet fanfares, fifths. And see, so... Those are fifths, and it's the same shape, isomorphic, you see? Intervals of a fifth are used in major chords and in minor chords, and also in what we call five chords, which are power chords which don't have a third, so they can be major and minor. So this interval, this fifth shape, is very, very important. Right, we're getting there. Sixth intervals, so it's getting wider and wider, the gap between the two notes is getting wider and wider. This can be found by going downwards diagonally, like we just did, going to the next row and along two buttons. So if I play C, go diagonally down and then along one to A. C to A is a sixth. Okay, so let's play D, go down diagonally and along one. D to B is a sixth. Okay, so we have A here which is row two, button three, and go down diagonally and along one, two, F sharp, A to F sharp is a sixth. So A, B, C, D, E, F, see so six letter names, sixth. That's an interval of a sixth. Obviously very important when making sixth chords, so like A6, six, C6, six, D6, six, that kind of thing. This won't mean much to you unless you've played chords before, if you're a guitarist or a keyboard player, but it's something we're going to be doing in the future. So this is exactly the same as the minor third interval, but instead of coming up and up, we go down and down. We've got three to go now. Flattened seventh intervals can be found by going upwards diagonally in a straight line across two rows. So if I play this note here, which is C, row one, button one, 
go diagonally up, miss that, and go to this one, next one in the diagonal. Okay, so it's just coming diagonally, so we go from C, miss out F, and go to B flat. Those two notes, that interval is a flattened seventh, very important for playing seventh chords. So wherever you've got that shape, play one, miss one, play one, that's a flattened seventh. So in that case, I am playing a D and I'm playing a C. D and C is a flattened seventh interval. Obviously used in seventh chords like C7 and D7. Major seventh intervals can be found by going downwards diagonally to the next row and then along three buttons where you can. Obviously there's only so many buttons so you can't do this all over the keyboard but you can in a few places. Uh, so if I go to my good friend C, row one, button one, and if I go down diagonally and along three, that sounds a bit discordant, C with a B, because actually those notes, if they were next door neighbours, would be a clash of a minor second. But because we're making that B so far away, we can get away with it. So if we add the third, like the E, so C, E and B, doesn't sound so bad, it kind of sweetens it a bit. These are major seventh intervals. It's the true seventh of the scale of C, which is B. Played with the C, see? Major sevenths. We're really getting deep now, aren't we? Right, here's a nice easy one. The octave. Now the octave is the same note, 12 higher. And these are dead easy because we have C here. Go forward to the next one exactly in line. So you have to jump a row. That's C. So C and C. Or D and D. Okay? You may not realise that, but it's very easy, isn't it? So we have E and E. Okay? So we have... F sharp and F sharp, straight forward, miss out a row, and that is the octave. It's got the same name, but it's just 12 higher. These can be found by going straight across two rows, F to F, C to C. Octaves are often used to double up the root note or the tonic in major and minor chords as well as many others. Right, very near the end of this lesson now. I've got one more chart to show you. And this is concerning major scales. Now, I'm not a great believer in teaching scales, but I know a lot of people like to learn scales, and it's not a bad thing to do. And there are four major scales on this instrument that all have the same shape, that isomorphic thing again. So look at C major. If I just play it for you. So I use three buttons on row one, four buttons on row two, one button on row three. I use fingers one, two, three, one, two, three, four, two. And that was a major scale of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, no sharps and flats. Now, if I move down one button to D, okay, and do exactly the same shape, but one button down a piece. Now, listen, we've got this. I did exactly the same thing, but I moved everything down by one button. And that gave me the scale of D major. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. I used exactly the same fingers. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, two. If I start on F, row two, button one, and do the same thing, see what happens. F. G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. Three buttons on this row, four on this row, one on this row. Fingers one, two, three, one, two, three, four, two. Same shape, moved over, and it's a major scale of F. One more to show you. So I'm going to show you G major scale, same thing. We need three rows to be able to do this, and we need at least four buttons on the second of the three rows. So I'm going to start on G, which is row two, button two. I'm going to play three buttons on that row, four on this one, and one on that last row. So I'm going to play G, A, B, and then I'm going to play C, D, E, F sharp, and then I'm going to end on G. So it's fingers one, two, three, one, two, three, four, two. So those four scales is exactly the same shape on the layout, just starting in different places. C major.
F major and G major. So that's brilliant, that, isn't it? It's a great way to find your way around using this fantastic isomorphic layout. Well, so if you got to the end of that, very well done. I know it was a bit of a rigmarole, but in my own mind, I feel happier about it as well because I've certainly learned a bit myself by doing this. So to sum up, learning and grasping this concept of how the notes are laid out on the Hayden duet is key to understanding chord shapes. OK, and we're going to get to those later on in the course. I mean, just two notes played together like this. Some people call that a chord. I always think you really need three notes for a chord, but, you know, two notes technically is a chord. A chord, of course, is where we play two or more notes simultaneously. You can break chords up into what we call arpeggios, but at the moment I'm thinking of actually playing the notes at the same time. I will be teaching you lots of chords in due course. You've already learnt two in Drunken Sailor. We did D minor, this one here, and C major, this one here. So there we are. That is the end of this lesson on the isomorphic layout of the Hayden Duet Concertina. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? So useful. So please spend some time learning this. Print out all the charts. If you have any questions, do get in touch. Thank you very much for watching this video and you'll see me in the next one.